If you thought yesterday was messy, maybe you can blame the Treasury Secretary and not the Fed Chair. We'll get into that. Equity futures trying to bounce up a half of 1% from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, coming up, Fed Chair Jay Powell opting for a hike-and-see approach. Secretary Yellen ruling out blanket deposit insurance as First Republic receives another credit downgrade. We begin with the big issue, split-screen confusion in D.C. Chair Powell looking to restore confidence. You've seen that uh, we have the tools to protect depositors when uh, there's a threat of serious harm to the economy or to, or to the financial system, and we're prepared to use those tools. And I think depositors should assume that their, that their deposits are safe. That was around the same time Secretary Yellen was on Capitol Hill saying this. We've that, not considered uh, or discussed anything having to do with blanket um, insur insurance or guarantees of deposits. Those comments coming a day after this. Our intervention was necessary to protect the broader U.S. banking system and similar actions could be warranted if smaller institutions suffered deposit runs that posed the risk of contagion. So what's the difference? Well, there's a pretty big difference. Possibly using the systemic risk exception again for smaller banks, which would indeed make all depositors whole, is very different to considering blanket guarantees. And that's the point of tension that kept Secretary Yellen under pressure just last week. Every community bank, regardless of the size of the deposit, will they get the same treatment that SVBP just got? A bank only gets that treatment if the failure to protect uninsured depositors would create systemic risk. Team coverage begins right now with Bloomberg's Anne-Marie down in Washington alongside Katie Lyons. AMH, how do they resolve this one? Yeah, Jonathan, you're calling, calling it chaos and confusion, this split screen, but also it was a coincidence. She was testifying on a subcommittee on appropriations. It was supposed to be at the 2024 budget. They usually don't like to put Yellen out on the same day Jay Powell, the Fed chair, is speaking. The, the point of that tension you described perfectly. Secretary Yellen was asked about Congress and whether Congress had this authority to do this. And what she was trying to say is that they had to step in when you have the super majorities at the FDIC, at the Fed board, herself and the president deeming that this could potentially be systemic risk and contagion and more bank runs. They have this emergency authority to step in. What she was trying to make a point is that they are not looking at a blanket insurance deposit. Our reporting, though, shows that they, what they were temporarily doing, some officials behind the scene, was due diligence, looking at potentially what they could do, emergency powers they may have to temporarily lift the FDIC limit. Kelly, none of this bringing FRC much comfort. Yeah, well, it certainly didn't yesterday where the stock dropped almost 30 percent after Treasury Secretary Yellen spoke. Interestingly, you are seeing a bit of a bounce in pre-market trading this morning. That may mostly be technical. The stock is up about 7 percent right now before the bell. But there raises a question of whether this might be one of those banks that does get that exceptional treatment, even if nothing blanket is going on, considering it has been such a point of contention and a focus not just for the U.S. government, for, but for major Wall Street lenders as well. Now, of course, all of this said, we did get yet another downgrade for First Republic yesterday, the fourth in the span of a week. This one coming from Fitch, cutting the credit rating to B from double B. The analysts over there saying that the bank's funding mix has been materially altered over the last two weeks as withdrawn deposits have been replaced with costly wholesale borrowings, largely from the Fed discount window. And Fitch says due to those higher costs of funds, FRC is currently operating at a net loss that is not sustainable over the longer term, absent a balance sheet 
restructuring. restructuring. So that is not a great outlook. And clearly, while it's not weighing on the stock this morning, it only goes so far. The gains we're seeing today to undo the pain we have seen over the course of the last two weeks. This is a stock that remains down 89% over the last 13 days. The smallest move we have seen on the day over the last two weeks, John, is a move of 10%. Just incredible volatility with this. Brutal, move. brutal volatility. To the two of you, thank you. Kelly Lines and AMH there down in Washington, D.C. First Republic right now in the pre-market, as Kelly indicated, up by a little more than 6%. Joining us now to discuss, P. Jim's Robert Tip, Kathy Jones at Charles Schwab. Kathy, slightly unfair of me to ask a bond investor about this, considering what's happening in bank equities, but I think it applies. Can we resolve these issues without blanket deposit guarantees? Oh boy, I you know I think so, and I think that that's the effort that is taking place right now. I'm sure uh, behind the scenes, a lot of conversation about this. But look, you know, banks need to resolve um, the tension between the outflow of deposits and what's what's on their balance sheet. They need to build liquidity. Traditionally, or in the past, I should say, uh, say the savings and loan crisis, we did have to go through a pretty painful process of closing down a lot of institutions, merging them, and that tightened credit considerably. I think that's probably the closest analogy to what we might have, and that was actually probably much more severe than what we're facing. So I think it can be done, but um, I, I think a lot of work has to go into it. And the, the big difference now is we have much more social media attention to it, much more immediate reaction than we probably had in the past to these sorts of incidents. And that makes it complicated because that starts the, the deposit outflows and it gets to be you know, a really difficult thing to catch up on. The speed of it, it's happened so quickly. Robert Tip, it's just a couple of weeks. That's all, two, three weeks of this really starting to build. Robert, when you think about that, the speed at which it's happened, can this end without a big policy circuit breaker? Well, I think it can. It's not going to be comfortable. Um, but I think we got the signal from them on the way this unwound with SVB uh, that they could see the end game here. Uh, I mean, the good news with SVB, when that was unraveling, I said, oh, great, it's a Friday. They can mop this up over the weekend. And they came in during the middle of the day because they knew they had other fish to fry over the weekend. Uh, and I think they've had a lot of firefighting experience with the GFC. Uh, through the COVID crisis, uh, but banking, you know, the good news here is that asset quality is pretty good. Capital levels are pretty good, but banking is a confidence business. And they could see that this was going to rip through the system. If there was a loss of confidence, it would go through the regional banks, uh, go through community banks, and then it would come to the money center banks. And it would start with the weakest and make its way through them. They had to act forcefully. And I think they have the capability, um, bank by bank, if they take them under, to guarantee deposits if there's systemic risk. And any bank at this point, in my opinion, is systemic risk, and they know it. So I, I think they're, they're on the case. I think they'll be able to do it without uh, the blanket guarantee. And I think that's a good thing, because I don't think they can get it. Well, Robert, if it is resolved, if it is resolved, and even if it is resolved, overwhelmingly the consensus view on this program has been that it would inevitably lead to tighter lending standards, tighter financial conditions regardless. Now, Kathy, with that in mind, for the Federal Reserve, they've got to make their mind up. Is this mess a substitute for rate hikes? To some extent it is. To what extent is it? Yeah, that's really tough to measure. I mean, we've been trying to do some estimates, but it's really tough to measure at this stage of the game. Um, frankly, you know, had I been at the at Fed with a vote, I might have voted to pause uh, yesterday just to, to get a handle on that specific issue. You know, how much tightening are we going to see in credit conditions as a result of this? It's got to be the equivalent of a couple of uh, uh, rate hikes, 25 basis point rate hikes. I've seen estimates as high as one and a half. That sounds a bit high to me, but it does depend on how it plays out. But what we've already seen is that credit conditions were tightening. You know, the senior lending officers uh, surveys have shown that for over a quarter, about two quarters, we're seeing indications in the financial um, indexes, you know, financial conditions indexes. So we've already seen this trend begin. And uh, now it probably will accelerate because any bank that's looking at their loan book and looking at their deposits has to be more cautious, has to be more, more careful 
probably will pull back on some lending, and that will ripple through the economy, small and medium-sized businesses in particular. So, Robert, what's the difference between wait and see and you're done? Is the Fed done? Uh, you know, that's going to depend on how, how this goes. And uh, I think that, you know, the standard view on the lending is that they can't lend. You know, they're worried about whether they have enough money to meet their deposit needs. They can't be sending it out the, uh, you know, the, the back door to, uh, to loans that they've committed to in the past or that they might commit to in the near future. So it's going to hurt the economy. Uh, people are estimating could be a half percent, could be a percent and a half uh, that it takes down GDP. And, uh, you know, it's increased expectations for recession. I think, though, um, you know, last year we had a huge retrenchment in residential real estate. Uh, that subtracted about a percent from GDP growth, and the economy kind of powered through. Uh, so you may see some uh, resilience above and beyond what people think. Uh, but to me, the punchline here is really this is kind of a bond market nirvana. Uh, the Fed is up in the zone of being done. Interest rates have traversed from being at a half percent on the 10-year, one and a half percent into the threes. I think they could drift up towards four or so again if there is not a recession. Uh, but big picture, yields are high, and this market's going to be well-supported. People are going to be reticent to go into stocks. I think you're looking at a good environment here for bonds, and people shouldn't lose uh, focus on that. Well, I'm looking at claims from this morning at 191. I'm sitting here thinking, is anyone else looking at claims, Cathy? Because I don't think people are look at the economic data in quite the same way over the next month. Between now and early May, which is how much time we have left before the next Fed decision, when they say they're data-dependent, and, Cathy, I've asked this a few times, I'm sure you've heard me do it, what data are they dependent on between now and May? That's a great question. Um, you know, clearly, the employment data uh, is, continue to be important. And, and more specifically, I think, than jobless claims or even the jolt numbers these days is probably the wage numbers. and Because that's the ultimate measure of how tight supply and demand uh, the imbalance is in the labor market is how high our wage is growing. And they have decelerated. They've started to come down. I think most of the indications are that that's likely to continue. So on the jobs uh, end of things, I think the wage data continue to be really important. Um, but then they have to look at the, the other financial conditions and what's going on there. And that probably is going to send a much more negative signal on the economy. So I think that this, this is the tension that showed up uh, in the press conference and then the, the meeting yesterday. I think that's a tension that continues to drive the market going forward. But, but I would agree with Robert. You know, I think that this is a, a great environment for bonds. Um, I don't see 4% again on the 10-year. Uh, I think that wow. we're, we're, yeah, I, I think we're looking at lower, um, lower yields as the year progresses. We might bounce around a little bit here and continue this volatility, but I don't see 4% coming back again. I thought you were going to say low for longer. And that would open up a new conversation. <laughs> Kathy, we'll come back to that in just a moment. Kathy Jones, Robert Tip on this bond market. Neil Dutta of Remac had this to say yesterday afternoon, just on the wait and see stuff. He said, when uncertainty is high, policymakers enter wait and see mode. We're discussing that. We only get one jobs number between now and May. It is unlikely that's enough information to decide. For that reason, some people are leaning to the idea that they're done, at least for now. And in May, they're going to be on pause. We'll come back to that later. Let's get you some stocks on a move. Futures positive four tenths of one percent. Here's Casey. John, let's kick off with Coinbase because it's absolutely plunging pre-market. That's after it said in a filing last night that it had received a Wells notice from the SEC, which basically said that the regulator plans to sue the exchange. It said in that filing that the notice regards aspects of its listed digital assets and its staking service. You can see shares down about 18 percent right now. Moving on to earnings, Chewy, under pressure pre-market, it delivered a downbeat outlook for its sales growth. Also, fiscal year margin seen as flat to down slightly. You can see shares down by four and a half percent. General Mills, different story. It was a beat and raise quarter. The company boosted its adjusted EPS forecast for the full year. You can see that's boosting shares. And NVIDIA, this stock has absolutely been on fire. It's up about 130 percent from its October low. Got a price target upgrade from Needham this morning and shares are on track to rise for a ninth straight day, John. Katie, thank you. We'll come back to you around the opening bell about 15, 16, 17 minutes away. Futures positive coming up on this program. Chairman Powell attempting to reaffirm his fight against inflation. The process of getting inflation back down to 2% has a long way to go and is likely to be bumpy. That conversation up next.
Inflation pressures continue to run high. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2% goal and to keep longer term inflation expectations well anchored. The process of getting inflation back down to 2% has a long way to go and is likely to be bumpy. Chairman Powell speaking in Washington, D.C., following that decision to hike interest rates by 25 basis points. Mike McKee joins us now. Mike McKee, your take on that story yesterday. Well, I think, John, what we're seeing is sort of a two-track policy by the Fed. Jay Powell made it clear that they don't know what's going to happen with the banks. They expect some credit tightening, but they can't measure that uh, in terms of how much. And so they're going to keep on dealing with inflation because inflation remains too high. That's his key point from a monetary policy stance. They may raise rates at least one more time, he said, and he emphasized the word may as they try to tell everybody they're going to be data dependent. But they are going to leave rates high. And he did say uh, to me that uh, no interest rate cuts are planned, despite what the market seems to think at this point. And the evidence that we have at the moment is that's probably the right way to think about it, because we're not getting any evidence that the economy is significantly slowing, at least not from jobless claims this morning. They come in at 191,000, as you were talking about. We're right in a range. It just really hasn't changed all that much. The layoffs that we've seen announced haven't started hitting the economic data. And It'll be interesting to see how long it takes before that happens, if it even happens. So from here, we go on. We take a look at the inflation numbers ahead, the jobs numbers ahead. And here's, John, your new favorite economic indicator, the survey of senior loan officers <laughs> by the New York Fed. They ask bankers around the country once a quarter whether they are tightening lending standards or not. And you see the blue line there shows those who say they have tightened somewhat. That's kind of in a pretty normal range for an economic uh, slowdown. But the white line there is the people who have uh, tightened significantly, only 1.5 percent. The next report will come out sometime in April, and we'll see if that number goes up a lot, and then the Fed will have some sort of idea of what the banking situation means to their monetary policy path. Mike, I'm so pleased you pushed that forward in such a fantastic way. Mike McKee, thank you, down in Washington. Off the back of the question, Kathy and I were trying to explore just moments ago about, Kathy, what data we are dependent on. When they say data dependence going into the May meeting, it doesn't feel like it's CPI or payrolls. Kathy, it feels like it's loans and the loan survey that we get. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is what's going to drive the economy one way or another going forward. I mean, credit, credit availability is always a, a crucial um, indication of where the economy is going. You know, in, in periods where credit is widely available, standards are loose, as we've had for quite some time, um, you get a, you know, a lot of expansion in the economy. And um, we've turned that corner. We turned that corner last year, late last year. The question is now how fast do we go from here in terms of tightening um, credit standards and tightening credit conditions. I think that it goes fairly quickly because of what we've experienced in the last couple of weeks. Anybody running a small to medium sized bank, let alone a large bank, has got to be looking at this and saying they need to be cautious to avoid being the next one that gets a, a run on the bank and has to go to the Fed, um, the, the newly created um, BTFBI, I, I can't remember the acronym <laughs> now, but the newly created program where they can pledge the assets and, and pay 10, 10 basis points for it. Now, nobody really wants to be the one that has to go there. Hey, Kathy, there's too many acronyms at a time of crisis. We know that, and I forget them all as well. Robert Tip, let's talk bonds. Bob Michael, JP Morgan Asset Management, came on this show and he said the whole curve, twos out to 30s, 3%, 3.00%, not just a three handle, 3%. Robert, can we get that low? I mean, it's possible. I think if you have deposit outflows, if you have a big drop in lending, if you have a deceleration in the economy, uh, you have inflation pressures coming off, uh, there's no question you could end up that low or, or lower. Uh, but, but that would be a plausible place to end up if the economy was really weak and we we're seeing the inflation pressures come off. I think what... Um, 
you know, the first uh, area of resistance, I think that the Fed is going to be watching, coming back to your question on what data, I think, you know, first and foremost is going to be uh, deposits and whether they're staying in the banks. Uh, and if, if they get past that hurdle, if they get that to stabilize, then they can start thinking about the loans. The other major thing will be consumer confidence. Is spending stopping uh, because of what people are seeing in the headlines? So I think they're going to be paying attention to that. That's going to keep them on hold for, say, 60 days. I think one of the things we're seeing come through in the market, though, uh, that's going to, um, if it works, if optimism stays reasonable on the economy, it will be good for, say, high yield bonds, uh, but it will also be good for shorter term investment grade bonds. So your first one to five, one to 10 years of the curve, those are going to be kind of your sweet spots. I think your long term high quality could be under a little bit of pressure. Uh, that is, the Fed is clearly turning their focus to growth, making sure they support the expansion. You know, by necessity, they have to reduce their focus on inflation for now. And so I think the back end of the curve, you're going to see a little bit of uh, weakness in the back end of the curve. And even if you do get uh, a cut in short-term rates, which I'm not expecting, I think you could have some upward pressure in rates. And if it turns out that the Fed is able to hold at these levels, or they're going to end up going back to hikes later on, which I know seems completely crazy at this point in time, um, then, you know, you could end up with higher rates. But, you know, in the late 90s, there were cycles where they'd hiked a lot in 94, and they ended up, uh, you know, with some up and down movements around that terminal rate. We could yeah. end up with a scenario like that. Robert, I'm happy you brought it up. It does sound crazy to some people, but you've got to remember, two weeks ago, we were talking about no landing. You get through a couple of weeks without a bank failure. You see a market start to rally again. You see some decent data. This narrative will shift back pretty quickly if that takes place. Robert, thank you. Robert Tibb, Kathy Jones to the two of you. I think it was Jeff Rosenberg of BlackRock who said yesterday, remember the risk cuts both ways. The risk cuts both ways. Coming up, the morning calls and later. Why David Bianco of DWS expects the banking turmoil to have long-lasting implications. Plus, BNP Sam Linton-Brown discussing the key differences between the Fed and the ECB. That conversation coming up. Five minutes away from the opening ballot, equity futures positive a half of 1% on the S&P. Let's get you some morning calls. First up, Deutsche Bank downgrading Chewy to hold after earnings, expecting user growth to remain tepid throughout the rest of the year. That stock's down 4.5%. City upgrading Marathon Oil to buy, naming the stock one of their top picks due to its improving outlook and upcoming positive catalysts. And finally, Oppenheimer downgrading Coinbase to peer perform, growing more concerned about the company's outlook after receiving a Wells notice from the SEC. Coming up, focus remaining on the financials. David Bianco of DWS explains why bigger is better when it comes to the U.S. banks. That conversation coming up next. You're opening bell just around the corner. All it takes sometimes is a couple of days of gains on the S&P 500. No talk of imminent bank failure. And people will start to say crisis over. It's too soon. Equities right now, positive six tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq. We're high by a little more than one four percentage point. Yesterday was tough. It was difficult. We had a down day. Let's see if we can bounce. There's your opening bounce. Switch to the board and get to the bond market. Yields look like this on a ten year, higher by three or four basis points. Just sub three fifty at four. T six ninety six three forty six ninety six on a U.S. ten year. On the FX market, or rather in the FX market, the euro against the dollar, euro dollar 108.89, positive a third of 1%, stronger euro. We were through 109 a little bit earlier, looking for an ECB to keep on hiking and maybe for a Fed to pause. That's an interesting development in the last week. In the commodity market, crude positive a third of 1%, $71 and about 14 cents. About 30 seconds into this session, your stock market looks a little something like this on the S&P, positive three quarters of 1%, on the Nasdaq up by more than 1%, higher by 1.24% at the moment. One sector to watch at the open, the banks. Coming off another volatile session of steep declines after Secretary Yellen pushed back against blanket deposit guarantees. First Republic rebounding despite racking up yet another credit downgrade, this time from Fitch, saying that its balance sheet is not sustainable. Kelly Lyons 
brutal for this bank over the last few weeks. Yeah, brutal indeed, John. And I would just caution, as we look at an opening move that is to the upside by about 9% this morning, we haven't seen two back-to-back -back updates for this stock in about a month. Every day we see a gain, it is followed by a loss, and in recent history, usually a steep one the following day. So just keep that in mind as we take a look at the gains today. It is up about 9%, but that follows a 15% loss yesterday for PacWest, which is up by about 4.25%. It was down 17% after not only Treasury Secretary Yellen's comments, but also disclosing that it's seen about 20% of its deposits uh, flowing out over the last several weeks, hence why they had to tap Atlas for $1.4 billion in cash. Just to zero in on First Republic, though, because as you mentioned, John, it got hit with yet another credit downgrade yesterday, the fourth in the span of a week. We can just see how this has been an incredibly volatile stock of peaks and valleys altogether over the last two weeks, down about 90 percent. And the, the future of this bank still remains very much in question. We know that the government is working with Wall Street, major Wall Street lenders to orchestrate uh, some kind uh, of aid here further to the $30 billion in deposits they've already given. But this is a bank whose future still looks looks very much in flux. How much is that applicable to the rest of the regional banks, given that First Republic is seen as one of those that had more concentrated exposure is an open question, but that it hasn't uh, really stopped the regional banks from trading largely in tandem. And what that means is trading largely uh, below underperforming the broader financial sector as this risk is still seen out there, even if things seem calmer on the surface. John. Kaylee, let's get the tech names on the board as well. Let's look at Snap and look at Meta. How important is this hearing going to be later on today? Well, the hearing definitely will be important, but also if the ultimate outcome of this hearing or of legislation and Biden administration proposals that have been put forward results in a TikTok ban, that in theory will uh, benefit the likes of SNAP. Meta and Alphabet. Of course, Chu is going to be testifying in about 30 minutes at 10 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. He is largely going to be faced with no allies in Congress who are very critical of TikTok and its owner bite dance and the possibility that it poses a serious national security risk to the 150 million Americans that use it by collecting their data and sharing it with the Communist Party of China. So it's definitely going to be very contentious. And ultimately, if a ban uh, is put into place, John, in theory, because TikTok charges less for ads as an able to snap up market share uh, that way and, of course, has a lot of eyeballs. It could benefit those other social media players. Our analysts here at Bloomberg Intelligence actually see YouTube as one of the biggest beneficiaries in terms of user market share. And, of course, maybe other social platforms can snap up more ad dollars as well, John. Hey, Kaylee, thanks for that. Let's get back to the banks. True is cutting its price target on more than two dozen bank stocks today, seeing potential upside for one name, writing the following. We are lowering our estimates to reflect lower net interest margins and higher credit costs. We continue to favor banks with conservative credit cultures, strong balance sheets, and see the most relative near-term upside in banks with dislocated valuations such as buy-rated Western Alliance. That stock is gaining, or rather KBW Bank Index right now is gaining by about six-tenths of one percent. That's the financials. Let's get to ten cents. Shares jumping the most since January thanks to fourth quarter revenue growth boosted by ad sales. Katie Greifert has more. Hey, Casey. Hey, John. Well, yeah, we've been talking a lot about TikTok this morning, but Tencent, to your point, is surging. Of course, this is China's leading social media company. And like you said, share soaring after earnings. And on unconfirmed reports that Chinese Premier Li visited Tencent's offices on Thursday. Again, this is unconfirmed. But remember, Li is Xi Jinping's top deputy after taking over the premiership in March and he visited automaker BYD earlier this week so a lot of speculation that he also paid 10 cent a visit as well and today's gain adds to a rally that's really been building for months 10 cent it's gained more than 200 billion dollars of market value since October's lows and in recent weeks as you can see it's pulled away from the Hang Seng index and currently up about eight percent right now John. Katie, thank you. DWS's David Bianco expecting the banking turmoil to continue, writing this. Small banks will remain challenged with big profitability pressures as the largest banks will take share. We are overweight the biggest banks in the United States. David joins us right now. David, I want to ask you this. Do you think we can resolve these banking issues, the financial instability, without blanket deposit insurance in this country? I don't think that blanket deposit insurance uh, explicitly is, is a good idea or necessarily the cure for the challenges that banks are facing right now. Now, obviously, the commitment and the legislation already exists that under a national uh, emergency that all deposits would be made safe by all means of government. But I think what we've got going on here is we're moving past the panic. 
but there are still pains that so many banks, particularly smaller banks, will face on their funding costs. Yes, the net interest margins will continue to come under pressure. And uh, we are concerned about regional banks and those that tend to go to them to borrow. Um, but I, we're overweight the biggest banks because despite the best intentions, it looks like they're going to gain share. I would simply suggest that the Fed, you know, they're, we're confident in their ability to put out fires and, and deal with individual banks that might be problematic at a time. But I think they need to address the funding costs that uh, so many smaller banks are facing right now. And uh, the, the, the tool for that for over 100 years is the discount rate. And uh, I'd like to see some divergence between the Fed funds rate to fight inflation and the discount rate, um, perhaps going lower or not going up anymore to improve the positioning of, of bank funding costs. What you're recognizing, David, though, is what a lot of people have seen. What they believe right now is that we have a two-tier banking system in America. You like the biggest banks in America for obvious reasons. Can you tell me what would make regionals investable for you? Yeah, like I said, I think uh, if the discount window, which is not only open wide, uh, but if the discount rate were uh, a bit of an advantaged rate to the member banks, um, and we, we, we strongly believe these are all assets that are good. This is a, 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 an asset liability mismatch issue. So we think that not only should the Fed provide liquidity, but the Fed should also make sure that these banks aren't put into a greatly disadvantaged position to have to scramble for deposits and have to pay up you know, quickly uh, to keep these deposits. You know, if, the, if the discount rate were lower, it would give banks more time to reprice their deposits uh, and to also reprice their loan books and securities books to get to higher yields. We're at the stage of, of this where it's not about liquidity, it's about cost of liquidity. David, currently this Fed believes that this issue right now, to some extent, is a substitute for rate hikes. Do you agree with right. that? I think the Fed basically said that. I think the, the Fed basically said that they expect and that they are willing to accept that challenges, especially at these smaller banks, will help them fight inflation. Um, well, this, is, this, is, this would be a concern to, to, to the banks and the communities uh, that, that count on small banks. Uh, I think the Fed is saying they expect tighter credit conditions uh, to be uh, through smaller banks to be the transmission channel of their tightening policy. And if, if that's the case, and uh, they're not going to do anything about it more broadly for, for smaller banks overall, uh, then we have to expect that, uh, uh, that smaller banks, their profitability will be challenged. And as I said, those that typically go to them for loans would be challenged as well. Well, David, this is going to have obvious consequences for the economy. It's almost like don't believe your own eyes when you look at the bond market. The Fed's going to tell you rates are X, but right. we're going to know based on this that actually financial conditions are tighter because the supply of credit is going to get choked off by this situation. So when you think about the relationship between where rates are in the bond market, where Fed funds is, and how you think this economy is going to evolve. Hasn't that just changed over the last couple of weeks? Well, look, the Fed continues to say that the overnight rate is going to be 5% or higher and that it will be a long hold uh, at 5% or higher. And I think they've made it really clear that the bar for cuts is a high bar, which means either it's going to, be a, it's going to have to be an unmistakable recession breaking out um, because I don't think they're going to be cutting, even modestly cutting, on just some kind of short period of evidence of disinflation. Uh, this has been the biggest inflation problem in 40 years. This is a stain on their records. Uh, I, I think what the bond market is saying is that I think the bond market actually hears the Fed yep. on the high and long hold, but the bond market's probably saying, you know what, there's a 50% chance of, of, of that significant recession. But David, I guess what I am saying is the Fed is saying five. And they're not saying 550. But without this, they would be saying 550. But because of this, they're saying five. But essentially, right. it's at 550. Does that make sense to you, David? What I'm trying to ask here is, is if, if, they're, if they're at five, you add on a layer of financial instability, this idea that the Fed's backed away and you can get long some of these assets because things are getting better, that's just not the way, I guess, the way I see it right now, David. Do you see it a different way? No, I see it the way you're seeing it, that basically the Fed is accepting financial condition, particularly credit availability at small banks as part of their Fed, their inflation fighting arsenal. And, uh, you know, that just means you need to be careful with how you invest. It's a challenge to smaller banks. It's a challenge to those that go to borrow from them.
That's it. <laughs> is, is it a challenge to tech when you see the Nasdaq rip in because well, people this believe is why the Fed's it, back in the, a way? The equity market has been remarkably resilient, but with a tremendous rotation um, from financials, from many value cyclicals, it's the revenge of big cap tech. Um, now, look, I, I, would, I would simply say I find the overall equity market above fair value. I think full fair value immediately is about 3,800 on the S&P. Uh, and that'd be full fair value, maybe 4,100 a year from now, which is 18 times earnings that still have downside risk. David, you're awesome. It's great to catch up. David Bianco there of DWS on this equity market. We are about 11 minutes into this. Still positive, three quarters of 1% on the S&P and the Nasdaq, up a little more than 1%. Coming up, global central banks taking center stage. If we need to raise, height, uh, raise rates higher, we will. On the basis of the last projection, it's still clear that we might have uh, more to do. And that conversation up next with BMP's Sam Linton Brown. This is Bloomberg Z Open. I'm Lisa Mateo, live in the principal room. Coming up, Joe Sitt, CEO of Thor Equities. That conversation at 10.30 a.m. Eastern, 2.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. If we need to raise, height, uh, raise rates higher, we will. I think for now, though, we see the likelihood of, of credit tightening. We know that that can have a, you know, an effect on the macro economy, on demand, on labor market, on inflation. And we're going to be watching to see what that is. Jeff Howe committing to price stability amid concerns over a deepening banking crisis. This coming as the ECB says there's more work to do. In terms of, in terms of direction, if there is stabilization in the market, I think, again, on the basis of the last projection, it's still clear that we might have uh, more to do. The Bank of England making its own move today, raising rates by 25 basis points, saying the following. If there were to be evidence of more persistent pressures, then further tightening in monetary policy would be required. Lizzie Burden joins us now out of London alongside Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Lizzie, 25. Is that 25 and done or 25 and more to come? <laughs> well, markets think that this is the end, and I've been getting the drip drip of economist notes in my inbox, and many of them think this is the end, including our in-house economists at Bloomberg Economics. I think that line that you picked out from the minutes, you can read two different ways. On the one hand, you could read it as them saying it really has to be persistent inflation evidence for them to go again. You could read the vote split as dovish because even the big hawk Catherine Mann has scaled back her vote to 25 basis points. But on the other hand, you could interpret them as saying, we've had this upside inflation surprise yesterday, we're keeping uh, some powder dry. And you could interpret the vote split as hawkish because you didn't have John Cunliffe joining the dissenters as the economists had expected. I just would read the vote overall the 25 basis points as a compromise because on the one hand they're showing that they're fighting inflation on the other hand they're taking some of the advice of the dove Silvana Tenreiro and Swati Dingra that you need to be careful about the impact of previous hikes on the economy when it's already weak. Maria I have to say listening to ECB officials the hawks over there aren't in a compromising mood at all. Absolutely not. And, and Jonathan, we've had this frenzy of communications from the European Central Bank. We've heard uh, from the head of the ECB already three times. Remember, on the Thursday, on the Monday, yesterday in Frankfurt. And guess what? Tomorrow she'll be in Brussels. And they try to hammer down two messages, essentially. One is price stability and, of course, uh, financial stability. There's no trade-off. They're going to continue to handle both. And that means, as you say, more hikes. Now, I think that takes us to a conversation on the forward guidance, which is, at one point, it was very explicit. Some of that has been muted, but you played that clip with the Belgian central banker yesterday. I spoke to Mr. Woods uh, yesterday. He was very clear. You know, he is a hawk, and he was clear. And right now, we need to wait for the market to stabilize, but it is obvious that more may be to come. How much? That is a question. The other issue that I would just want to briefly uh, point out and make make you smile is European officials say they want to put this bank in turmoil to rest, close this chapter, and they say for once it's not our fault. It was the U.S. regulators and the Swiss regulators that created this mess. Hey, Maria, thanks for that.
I think a lot mm -hmm. of people are blaming each other at the moment. Maria Tadeo and Lizzie Bernard over in London and Brussels, respectively. Thank you. Sam Linton Brown of BNP Paribas laying out key differences between the Fed and the ECB, saying this. Powell did not talk about separation principle. Lagarde did. This implies greater sensitivity for the Fed to financial stability concerns than the ECB. Furthermore, one could argue the outlook for inflation remains more uncertain in Europe. Sam joins us now. So, Sam, great to have you with us. The euro through 109 a little bit early this morning, just short of that now. What kind of levels are you thinking about? Good morning, John. We think it will break 110 on a sustained basis. We target this year 114 in EURUSD. The move from here we expect to be more of a grind than we do a, a sharp appreciation. A key point for that bullish view, as you were just pointing out, is potential differences between the Fed's sensitivity to financial stability compared to the ECB. We heard a lot um, at the last ECB meeting about the separation principle. We didn't hear that at all yesterday from Powell. What we heard is that credit conditions have tightened. And so this suggests, and I think the market's perception is, that the Fed will be more constrained with rate hikes because in the US, some of the financial instability we're seeing might be a function of more of a common problem related to mismanagement of duration risk, while in Europe, it's a little bit more idiosyncratic. So, Sam, that's the rate differential story. What do you think that means for growth on either side of the Atlantic? How bad do you think this gets for the US versus how good do you think it's going to be for Europe? Our expectation is that the US will enter recession. We think that will occur in Q3. We're not talking about a deep recession here. We think it's a shallow recession, about um, one percentage point of growth from peak to trough. We think it will last three quarters. In Europe, in contrast, we don't think there will be a recession. We think that risk has been avoided because of the energy situation having improved from very extreme levels before. And in Europe, you don't need a recession to get inflation back to target. And you just need growth beneath trend for a sustained period of time. If I bring it back to the market view and euro dollar, I think that relative growth outlook is quite important because it means we've got a situation where front end rate differentials, which are usually in the dollar's favor, are beginning to compress. We've got a situation where growth in Europe is set to outperform the US, which favors rotation into European risky assets. And we've got a situation where the current account in Europe has also normalized, which means that the structural flow dynamic is quite supportive for the pair to continue trending higher. So when you push all of this through the FX market, everything you've just said makes sense. If it transpires, if it materializes, develops in the way that you explain. The tougher one for me at the moment, Sam, you had that big call on European banks, and I won't talk individual names with you because of the nature of your job. I understand the sensitivity of that. But just the banking universe in Europe, great trade when you made the call last summer. Sam, has the world changed? The case is somewhat less compelling now than it was before, but we still think the sector is set to outperform. A key part of this is the valuation argument that clearly is, is a well-told story, one in which valuations are at crisis levels. We don't think that's justified. The other element here is that you still have a um, tailwind from, from rates. Of course, given what's happened recently, there's some more two-way risk around that, around that view, but we think nonetheless it's an attractive risk reward to think that it's a sector um, that is set to outperform. Sam, just the last question from me. When that headline, the US is in recession, comes through, we'll be able to see it before that headline ultimately drops. But when that growth experience becomes worse, when that headline crosses or a series of headlines, whatever it might be, sentiment's going to get hammered worldwide, you'd think. And Sam, surely that's going to drive a bit into the US dollar. What's the argument against that? The argument against that is the reason the dollar usually rallies in risk off is funding stress that there's a funding squeeze, that people who need access to dollars aren't able to source those dollars at that time of peak stress. We saw that in 08, we saw that during COVID. But the Fed have introduced a number of new facilities, and we've written quite a lot about that this week, our head of macro strategy in the Americas, Calvin C, that the number of facilities the Fed have now introduced, and more recently, making the frequency of FX swap um, operations daily, yeah. really preempts the potential for that funding stress to permeate into the market. So we don't expect the dollar to surge even when there are periods of financial stress. Interesting. I've got to catch up with Calvin soon as well. Reminded me to do that. Sam, thank you. Sam Linton Brown, FBNP Paribas. Equities right now doing okay, up nine tenths of 1% on the S&P 500. Up next, your trading diary.
So far, so good. It's a better morning. Let's see if this sticks. We're up by nine tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq, by about one point five percent. That's the price action. Here's the trading diary. Coming up, TikTok CEO testifying on Capitol Hill at the top of the hour. Secretary Yellen continuing her congressional testimony at 3 p.m. Eastern time. Plus, President Biden heading to Canada for a meeting with the Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. Rounding out the week with Fed speak from St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard on Friday, along with more economic data points, including US PMIs and durable goods from New York City. That does it for me. Good luck for the rest of the trading day. And thank you for choosing Bloomberg TV. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg. Thank you.